Seeing as it's a franchise involving a time machine, Doctor Who has maintained a very interesting relationship with history. In the early days of the series, the show had historical adventures that, outside of the presence of the Doctor, his companions, and the TARDIS, had no science fiction elements at all. Traveling the Silk Road with Marco Polo, confronting the human sacrifices of the Aztecs, riding around inside the Trojan horse. While not always perfectly historically accurate, these adventures always seem to have something to say about the violent, unpleasant nature of man throughout history. As time went on, however, the historical mutated with the introduction of the weird and the alien. What if time-traveling criminals hid out in Victorian London? What if the Middle Ages had a laser weapons arms race? What if aliens exploited 19th century miners? While never going away completely, historical adventures took a backseat to the stranger, more colorful science fiction, and that seemed to still be the case when Virgin New Adventure started up. Oh, it started off fairly past-focused, with the first two books taking place in the era of Gilgamesh and World War II, but the vast majority of the books have been forward-looking. The last six books have all taken place in future space colonies. But there were still a few writers interested in the historical, and we'll be looking at one of the subgenre's biggest supporters today. This is White Darkness by David A. McKinty. Haiti in the 1910s was a very volatile place. With upheavals and assassinations, the presidency of the country had changed hands five times in just four years between 1911 and 1915. The last president of this cycle was Jean Vilbrun Gilliam Sam, a commander of Haiti's North Division. During this time, Haiti was expanding its commercial and strategic ties with the United States, which was in conflict with Germany's economic control of the region. The sparse German population, only about 200 individuals, controlling 80% of the country's international commerce. The opposition of this economical shift was led by Dr. Roselvo Bobo. Fearing for his own standing as president, Sam took extreme measures to oppress opposition. President Sam's actions led to their extreme on July 27, 1915, when he ordered his chief of police, General Charles Oscar Etienne, to clean out and execute all 167 political prisoners being held at the time, including one of those former presidents. This act of cold-blooded murder brought the rage of the people, who rioted and stormed the government, with Sam and Etienne overthrown and killed. Fearing that Dr. Bobo would take the presidency and ruin their ties with the country, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson ordered a Navy occupation of the country. The United States seized the capital and installed their own president, and would end up occupying the country until 1934. This is the real-world history that the Doctor, Ace, and Bernice Summerfield have found themselves in. The Doctor tried to aim for the beaches of Florida for a nice vacation, but missed, and now they're trapped between the fascist rule of Sam and the uprising of Bobo, their TARDIS having been taken away from them by armed forces. But the Doctor fears there's more to it than that. There's a strange psychic background hum about the place, as if some powerful mind was present somewhere, contained, and then the dead body starts showing up. They weren't killed by soldiers, not by guns or knives, but instead their bodies appear torn apart, torn apart by human hands. It seems there's another game being played in the background of all this civil unrest. On the other side of the board is Giles Lamate, an impossibly old voodoo priest who leads the local ceremonies. He's working with German forces to raise an army of zombies to use in the German front of World War I. Typically, the zombies created in voodoo practices are people with no free will, but Mate is creating something a bit more Romero, zombies that can withstand mortal injury. However, there's more to it than German dominance. Mate is the servant of a mysterious sleeping being buried deep underground. Mate's true goals is to awaken his master, an act that could bring an end to the human race. So yeah, this book is one of the more intense ones. Between the riots, political backstabbing, secret German military operations, and zombie uprisings, it seems like a violent death is always right around the corner. Even during the book's more quiet, reflective moments, your brain kinda fills in faraway gunshots as background noise. In the Doctor Who gun frock spectrum, this is one of the most gunny gun stories we've talked about in this series. It's trying so hard to be dark, serious Doctor Who that the book makes a point to change the Doctor's wardrobe. Finally ready, he left the console room. He was greeted by a pair of unashamedly dumbfounded stares when he entered, 
Ace looked him up and down, from the battered and sagging white fedora, complete with paisley hatband, to the two-toned cream and brown brokes he always wore. Her gaze was arrested by the glistening silk shirt and green silk cravat that broke up the plain cream-colored feel of his rather wrinkly linen suit. Smeg in hell, she whispered staggly. It's our man in Havana. You nearly gave me a heart attack there, doctor, Benny added. I thought Peter Laurie had just come back from the dead. Well, it's nice to know people from the 26th century still know who Peter Lorre is. But yes, this is a story serious enough to put away the question mark pullover. However, unlike Virgin's other capital G gun stories, which have been mostly gritty cyberpunky affairs, White Darkness aims to portray real-world human atrocities that the Doctor and his companions are largely powerless against. More importantly, while this is very much a modern type of Doctor Who historical where the supernatural intersects with history, it is not a story about the supernatural influencing history. The crimes against humanity committed by President Sam and General Etienne run in parallel to the zombie stuff, but it would all still have happened if the zombie stuff didn't happen. Contrast that with Terence Dick's Time War Exodus, which suggested that Hitler only managed to rise to power thanks to advanced alien technology trivializing the real atrocities of the Nazi party as the end result of extraterrestrial meddling. While not a pure historical, White Darkness most closely resembles the pure historical story The Massacre of St. Bartholomew's Eve, where the first doctor and his companion Stephen arrive by accident to 1572 Paris just in time for the wave of Catholic mob violence against Calvinist Protestants, resulting in the deaths of tens of thousands of people. We have four straight episodes, two hours, of our protagonist being largely ineffectual in the face of human prejudice, violence, and the march of time. It is arguably the biggest downer in the entire franchise. The Doctor and his companions aren't completely helpless in this book, as they have an adjacent plot involving space magic they can deal with, but there's little they can do about the actual historical violence, both due to the mechanics of time travel and just the sheer scope of it all. Like Stephen before her, Ace isn't totally convinced by this, and is prodding for any loophole that she could take advantage of. The general's going to murder a couple hundred people any day now. What? Ace and Bernice chorused. Political prisoners he'll have executed. Is this another one of your mystical observations? Ace demanded. A simple matter of history, but one which occurred in such an out-of-the-way corner of your planet that people took no notice. Ace looked up with her hooded eyes. I'm taking notice. No! The doctor's head snapped up and fixed her with a steely glare. This is a matter of recorded history. It has happened, it will happen, it must happen. None of us can stop it, and we must not even try. His eyes bored into her. Do you understand me? She nodded, her expression a mixture of disgust and wary sadness. All right, I won't try to stop it. The doctor remained glaring for a moment, trying to determine whether or not she meant it. Then he nodded. Good. I'd stop it myself if I could. You should know that by now. What happened to the general afterwards? Benny asked idly. He disappeared in the ensuing rebellion. Who knows? He cut himself off, silently cursing himself for failing to spot the obvious. Behind him, Ace smiled. Another parallel with White Darkness and the Massacre is that they both involve sadly more obscure moments in history events that were traumatic to those involved, but have been pretty much ignored and forgotten in the mainstream consciousness in Western society. These aren't really events you hear about in high school history class. In the case of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, I reckon this is a matter of so much history so little time, but the Haiti revolts and subsequent occupations by the United States was just barely over 100 years ago, and played a significant role in the US's entry into World War I. I certainly didn't learn about it in school. Hell, I don't think I would even have found Haiti on a map until I was in my 20s. My education on World War I focused pretty exclusively on the European front, and even then just a highlight reel of things like the Red Baron and the Christmas Truce. Again, so much history, so little time, but my education, and the education of many American kids, was largely European and United States centric, and the socio-political struggles of a small Caribbean country with an African slave descended population wasn't something my education system felt a need to bother with. Which segues into Doctor Who and its relationship to history. The franchise's transition from pure historical to historicals with science fiction elements overshadows another transition. One from a global focus 
to a Eurocentric focus. And this happened pretty early on. Four out of the eight stories that made up Doctor Who's first season could be described as historicals. In order, an unearthly child saw the TARDIS crew traveling to the Paleolithic era, Marco Polo took them to Central Asia in 2089, the Aztecs took them to 15th century Mexico, and the Reign of Terror put them in the French Revolution. With Marco Polo and the Aztecs, 50% of the season's historicals, 25% of the season's overall content, involved non-European cultures and histories, using a mainstream English family program to explore the non-English world. And then the show just stopped doing that. Every single historical story Doctor Who has aired, be it a pure historical or a science fiction historical, has focused exclusively on European and United States history. And that includes New Who too. Michael Moorcock basically called this out in his oddball 2010 Doctor Who novel, The Coming of the Terrafiles, where the 11th Doctor and Amy discuss a group of future Earth cosplayers. The League of Terrafiles, they're the ones who are the keenest reenactors. Most of their legendary sports are derived from those books. A bit bit centric, aren't they? Is that a word? Still, that explains it. Explains what? Why you show so little interest in the rest of the planet? That's not true. Well, you seem to like America too, but as for China, say, I'm very interested in China. <laughs> oh, really? Really? I wish I had more time to argue. Which brings us to the Virgin New Adventures. Time Worm Exodus took place in Germany, Nightshade takes place in England. In fairness, Time Worm Genesis takes place in Mesopotamia, which is West Asia, but that book is less a historical and more John Peel's erotic Conan the Barbarian fan fiction. White Darkness is the first major Doctor Who book in 29 years to meaningfully address non-European history. In fact, the Doctor Who story this book references the most is the last time it happened, the Aztecs with the doctor finding the brooch given to him by his accidental fiance. Before he took another step, however, his attention was caught by the weight in one of the jacket's pockets. Puzzled, he pulled out the weight, which turned out to be a small jade brooch. Finely carved from a single piece, it took the form of a serpent coiling around a beautifully finished eagle. He looked at it for several moments, recalling the graceful lady who had given it to him, since engagement rings hadn't been invented at the time. He had kept it in his pocket for a while, until after the business with the Dalek time machine, when Ian and Barbara had decided it was time to leave him and return to their own lives. Perhaps, he thought, he had been somewhat embarrassed by the whole situation, else why he had never worn it. It was all a long time ago, and after all, the brooch was intended to be worn. Perhaps, now that he had more experience and understanding of human emotions, he could accept it as the gift it was intended to be. Determinedly, he pinned it to his left lapel. This doesn't seem incidental. This is pretty clearly a book written by someone interested in the promise Doctor Who's old historicals made and later broke. So who is this someone? Who's the writer who wants to bring Doctor Who historicals back to their roots? David A. McKinty was born in 1968 in the UK. In 1985, he graduated from Bannockirk Burn High School in Scotland, and around that time was writing Doctor Who fan fiction for fanzines. He had grown up reading the target Doctor Who novelizations, and hoped that he could get in and write some himself. His first pitch was for a novelization of Mission to the Unknown, a single half-hour episode that served as something of a prequel to the mega-serial The Daleks' Master Plan. I'd fancied trying a novelization even before the original novel line got started, and I've still never done a novelization of anything, but would love to, just for the experience. In fact, I did some sample text for an expanded novelization of Mission to the Unknown, because I thought nobody else would be daft enough to try and turn it into a book, and didn't anticipate them just doing it as a chapter of the Daleks Master Plan. There was also the added complication that John Peel was the only person Terry Nation trusted to novelize his Dalek stories, so McKinty wouldn't have had an in even if Target had decided to make Mission to the Unknown a separate book. So that didn't work, but hey, there was still the TV show. McKinty sent Andrew Cartmill a pitch for a story called Avatar, which if it had been picked up would have been part of season 28. Doctor Who was cancelled after season 26. I got as far as the script for episode 1 and the outline for the rest. It was supposed to be a Lovecraftian thing, but there's probably a bit of an evil dead in there. 
The idea was to set it in Arkham, New England, but they wouldn't have the budget to go there, so I was in the middle of rewriting it for Cornwall when the series got cancelled. The basic idea was these body snatchers, aliens that could only inhabit the dead. The villain and his human corpse had got his fossilized remain of some sort of Silurian god and was planning to clone it. Toward the end, the villain was to get more and more decrepit in each episode, until there was just a skeleton at the end. So Target didn't work, the show itself didn't work, but McKinty had made enough contacts in the process that Virgin invited him to pitch original stories for their shiny new series. So he made a few pitches, his first being something called Mobius Trip, a story about two universes somehow inside one another. The pitch was rejected, but elements of it would end up in McKinty's 1997 missing adventures novel, The Dark Path. It was around this time that McKinty watched the Wes Craven film, The Serpent and the Rainbow, a film about Bill Pullman traveling to Haiti to investigate the creation of zombies through voodoo. McKinty hated the film but it did get him interested enough in the non-fiction book the film shared its name with, written by anthropologist Wade Davis. The Serpent and the Rainbow would prove to be the backbone for White Darkness, though it's worth noting that Davis's work is not without its critics. The central idea of The Serpent and the Rainbow is that Haitian voodoo cultures use a neurotoxin called tetrodotoxin to induce a death-like state that a person is then quote-unquote uh, resurrected from. Tetrodotoxin factors into white darkness quite a bit. Howard led them to one door and slid open the window. Inside was a malnourished woman in simple rags who was finishing a plain meal. She ate slowly and dully, as if not truly aware of what she was doing. She was barely able to lift the spoon to her mouth. That, Howard began, is a tetrodotoxin victim. We don't know her name or who her family are, but we're trying to bring her out of it. Usually it succeeds and they become something called a zombie savane, an ex-zombie as it were. However, the tetrodotoxin theory hasn't been substantiated by anyone else, and those who tested samples of ritualistic substance given to them by Davis suspected they were tampered with. Still, even today, the Serpent of the Rainbow is seen as a central resource for Haitian voodoo culture, so I don't exactly blame a pre-internet author using it like this. The actual Haitian history on display is detailed and pretty dang accurate as far as I'm able to tell. McKinty clearly took pride in his research, even thanking the Sterling Central Library at the beginning of the book, and since I'm something of a research junkie, I really respect that. Other inspirations McKinty cited were Sax Romer's The Island of Fu Manchu, where the titular villain has a secret stronghold in Haiti, and Dennis Wheatley's They Use Dark Forces, which has a German superweapon plot and weaponized hypnotism. But the thing McKinty really wanted to do was make good with his promise with Avatar and fold H.P. Lovecraft into Doctor Who. You know that powerful psychic being Mate is trying to awaken? It's Cthulhu. Not a Cthulhu-like monster, not Cthulhu with the serial numbers filed off, but the actual cosmic entity that was created by and at one time copyrighted by H.P. Lovecraft. Okay, let, let me clarify. It's not identified as Cthulhu in this book. Here it's just an unnamed Great Old One. We learn it was Cthulhu in Annie Lane's All Consuming Fire. McKinty has said it couldn't possibly be Cthulhu, not because that's not what he intended, he kinda did, but because, and I quote, Cthulhu's sunken city was in the Pacific Ocean. It's not Cthulhu because it would conflict with the Lovecraft canon. Even though this is a Doctor Who book and not a HP Lovecraft book, and why should we care about the Lovecraft canon? Whatever, it became Cthulhu, and it was obviously meant to evoke the eldritch horrors of Lovecraft. And that's hardly the only reference. A U-boat crew that shows up early in the book is supposedly a reference to the U-boat crew in the story The Temple. There's an American doctor named Howard Phillips, aka the HP in HP Lovecraft. McKinty also had Howard Phillips in Avatar. Oh, and Howard Phillips has an interesting book in his collection. He dug out a large, thick book from the bookcase, which creaked in relief, and laid it in front of the doctor. Where did you get this? The doctor breathed with a palpable mixture of fascination and horror. From Crowley. I once had cause to give him emergency treatment for an ulcer, and he gave me this in lieu of payment. The unexpurgated Necronomicon, huh? The doctor carefully opened the book and flipped through the yellowed pages, whose spidery script seemed to defy the eye's power of focusing. And with all of Rorick's original illustrations, 
the Doctor add tonelessly. This effectively begins a long stretch of Doctor Who playing around with Lovecraft in some way or the other, in this case basically implying that the works of Lovecraft are canon with Doctor Who. Why do this? Well, one, Lovecraft writings have fuzzy or no copyright, so it's an easy way to inject some known material with a growing geek fan base into the franchise. It also made a certain sense with where Doctor Who was at the moment. The Seventh Doctor was arguably the most effective and essentially the deadliest version of the character to date. This is a doctor that willingly destroys planets, commits genocide, sends people to their deaths, and he has a time machine. He's super dangerous, and there's a risk of old threats becoming trivialized. One could argue that you need to up the stakes to give this version of the doctor a real challenge, and Lovecraft offers a blueprint for that. Cosmic beings older than the universe, uncaring, unknowable, powerful enough to destroy all creation by shifting in their sleep, these beings would certainly be more of a match to the great chess master than, say, robots that are allergic to gold or potato. It's just... I don't know. Outright folding the Lovecraft universe into Doctor Who instead of coming up with your own derivative feels a bit gauche. Because when you evoke Lovecraft, you evoke all the racism that comes with it. And let me tell you, H.P. Lovecraft would not have been nice to the Haitian culture on display here. He would have called them savages, half-apes, primitives, and evil for it. Tying Lovecraft to a non-Western culture has certain negative implications, even if it's unintentional. And I'm not talking about Lovecraftian ideas, ideas influenced by Lovecraft's works. Cthulhu and the Necronomicon are in this book, tying it to the Lovecraft canon and by extension, all of Lovecraft's shitty ideas. You can actually see a shift in this when we get to the Eighth Doctor adventures. The Eighth Doctor is a much more romantic hero and far, far more improvisational, more likely to fly by the seat of his pants, and therefore the need of Elder God level threats diminishes. Not that the Lovecraft influence went away entirely, but those ideas would be examined in more reflective and sometimes directly contradictory lights, like this moment in the Eighth Doctor book, The Taking of Planet Five, which suggests that people have used Lovecraftian imagery to other their enemies. The Elder Things are fiction, the Doctor said firmly. Fiction you haven't even read, probably. By your time, there were at least 79 versions of the Necronomicon in print, but they all had their birth in the imagination of one harmless ice cream lover. Don't let the setting get a grip. This whole scenario is being sustained by technology beyond anything we've seen here yet. It can infiltrate the consciousness in a million ways. It's primed to add layers of verisimilitude, false memories, and so on. Give it an inch and we'll all be studied at Mesotonic University and dozed off in the witch house before you can say, typically doomed Lovecraftian protagonist. Again, McKinty himself is very respectful to the actual histories and cultures utilized here, and researched these subjects the best he could. It's only one character who actually worships Cthulhu, not an entire culture. But his decision to lay the Lovecraft on as thick as he did connects this to the marked legacy of Lovecraft's works. This is all big idea stuff, because this book is huge on big ideas. The actual prose and characters aren't nearly as interesting. The plot is complicated to a fault. There are a ton of minor characters to keep track of, and McKinty doesn't seem to feel character descriptions were all that important. I read the book twice, and I still needed to pull out a guide to keep it all straight. You could tell McKinty didn't really have a grasp on the companions. When he was writing this, Love and War hadn't come out yet, so all he had to go on was a brief primer on Bernice Summerfield, and as a result, Benny doesn't have a whole lot to do. Ace has changed so much to this point to be effectively a different character, so the book opts for a pretty basic what if maybe violence bad message by mirroring her against Major Richmond, a sadistic American mercenary. It's commentary, but a light commentary, something for Ace to mull over and wonder if she's making the right life decisions. But I really don't mind all of that. The book's ambitions override pretty much everything else. A well-researched book into a not well-known non-Western history, a challenge to fulfill a promise Doctor Who broke after its first year, one of the most darkest and intense books in the line, and folding the Lovecraft canon into the franchise? This is a book that makes you confront it on its own terms. It is not a fun romp through time and space. This is actual, challenging adult content. Not in a women getting groped way like Time Worm Genesis, not in a we can say fuck now like in transit, but by showing us the bleak, hopeless face of humanity 
and daring us to find a silver lining in it all. White darkness isn't for everybody. It's intense and unpleasant. I definitely wouldn't want the Virgin New Adventures to be like this all the time. I can't even say I really enjoyed reading it, but this is definitely a book I respect. Next time, The Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Also, Ace makes exploding candy and then gets naked to fool the bad guys. Yeah, this, this one's not nearly as interesting.